Hi, I'm Andrew Wilson at New York University, and welcome to the ICML 2020 tutorial on Bayesian Deep Learning. I'm very excited to be presenting this tutorial, and I'd like to especially thank Johan Bremer, Pavel Ismailov, Rajesh Ranganath, Christina Savin, and Hehe for helpful feedback in preparing the tutorial, as well as my students, collaborators, and colleagues, and the ICML program chairs and tutorial chairs for the opportunity. We'll start with a pattern recognition problem where we have airline passenger numbers indexed by time. We'll consider three different modeling choices. Choice one, a linear function. Choice two, a cubic polynomial. And choice three, a 10,000th order polynomial. Pause the video for a moment and consider which choice you would make in order to provide a good description of the data. Most people go with choices one or two. In this tutorial, we'll argue for choice three because the real world is a complicated place and there'll be some setting of the coefficients in choice three, the WJs, which provide a better description of reality than could be possibly managed by choices one or two, which are just special cases of choice three. In practice, we're often making something like choice three and using neural nets that have tens of millions of parameters to follow problems with just tens of thousands of data points and finding we often get very good generalization. In part two of this talk, we'll actually consider models with an infinite number of parameters that at the same time have very simple inductive dot biases and provide great generalization, even on problems with a small number of data points. To begin understanding the motivation for choice three, it's helpful to think about modeling from a function space perspective. Let's consider choice one, the linear function, f of x equals w naught plus w one x, and we'll just put a standard normal distribution over w naught and w one. And this will induce a distribution over functions, which we can visualize by sampling from this distribution over the parameters and looking at the different straight lines with different slopes and intercepts that we get. We'll get different w naughts and w ones, different straight lines. The gray shade here shows a 95% credible set containing 95% of these functions. And the solid blue curve here shows the expectation of this distribution over functions. In this diagram, we have a conceptualization of all possible data sets on the horizontal axis and the marginal likelihood or evidence on the vertical axis, which is the probability that we would generate a data set if we were to randomly sample from the parameters of our model. The model which we were considering on the last slide can just generate straight lines with different slopes and intercepts, not very many data sets. But because the marginal likelihood is a proper normalizable probability density, it's going to give a lot of mass to those data sets. We could alternatively consider a model like a multi-layer perceptron, which might have a lot of hidden units and layers, and we have a, a broad distribution over the parameters, and it can generate a wide range of different data sets, but it won't give any one of those data sets very much probability. We could alternatively consider a third type of model, like a convolutional neural net, which is very flexible. It can describe a wide array of different data sets, but at the same time, it has very particular inductive biases, like translation equivariance, which says that if we translate an image, we don't want to change the class label. And this means that these types of models are going to give a reasonable amount of mass also to structured image data sets and provide good generalization on those problems. In order to construct models with good generalization, we'll argue that we want large support, the support being which solutions are a priori possible, and reasonably calibrated inductive biases, the inductive biases being the distribution of support, which solutions are a priori likely. So we can consider the support to be the flexibility, and we want a lot of flexibility. At the same time, we should be careful not to conflate flexibility and complexity. In fact, in part two, as we've mentioned, we'll be considering models with infinitely many parameters that are extraordinarily flexible and at the same time provide very good generalization, even given very small data sets. By the same token, we should not treat parameter counting as a proxy for complexity. In this figure, on the left panel, we have the same diagram we had on the previous slide. In the other panels, we see what happens as these different models are exposed to a given data set. In green here, we see in the second panel, the model with large support is able to contain a good ground truth description of reality, but it has well calibrated inductive biases, so it efficiently collapses down onto that good description of reality. In the next panel in blue, we can hardly describe many data sets at all, just straight lines with different slopes and intercepts, and so while the model becomes quickly constrained by the available data, it becomes erroneously constrained and it starts to collapse down onto a bad solution.
And in the last panel, we have a flexible model which casts cast wide enough a net to provide a good description of reality, but it, it, doesn't ha it spreads its support too thinly to have good inductive biases and reasonable contraction around that good description of reality. In this tutorial, we'll argue that the key distinguishing property of a Bayesian approach is marginalization rather than optimization. That is, instead of using a single setting of parameters W, we want to use all possible settings of parameters and weight them by their posterior probabilities in what's called a Bayesian model average. And we'll argue that this Bayesian model average will be especially relevant in deep learning. I first became interested in Bayesian deep learning after listening to a talk about optimization, which is perhaps a bit ironic given what I said on the previous slide, we might characterize Bayesian methods as trying to avoid optimization at all costs. Don't just bet everything on a single setting of parameters, use all possible settings of parameters. The argument was being made that mini batch SGD would converge to flat regions of the loss, which would provide better generalization in deep learning than full batch gradient methods. In this diagram, we have a conceptualization of parameters on the horizontal axis and the value of the loss on the vertical axis, training loss in black, testing loss in red. We can see that a flat solution in train has reasonably low loss in test, whereas a sharp solution has pretty high loss after there's this horizontal shift between the training and the test loss, which will typically happen because our model won't be completely determined by a finite sample. When we evaluate the loss on different sets of points, even if they're drawn from the same distribution, we should get a different optimal setting of parameters. And the shape of the losses should be relatively similar because the training loss is still not a horrible proxy for generalization. Now, if this argument were true and it meant something, then to mean something, the different parameters in the flat region would have to correspond to different functions which provide compelling and complementary explanations for the data. Otherwise, we could just contrive flatness to reparameterization, and it wouldn't really mean anything. Then this was an extraordinary argument for following a Bayesian approach and doing marginalization or integration, basically integrating a flip version of this curve where we want to consider all of those good solutions and weight them by their posterior probabilities. In this sense, it might just be a bit arbitrary to bet everything on just one good solution, but we know that there are many. And so there are many reasons to be excited about Bayesian deep learning. Neural nets can represent a variety of complementary explanations for the data, and we'll be seeing this particularly in part three. And this will lead to better uncertainty representation, which is crucial for decision making. We could think from a practical perspective, if our model could never influence a decision conceivably, then it might not have much of a practical impact. But it will also have a big effect on the accuracy of our point predictions, which is perhaps an underappreciated aspect of the benefits of Bayesian marginalization in deep learning in particular. Because there are all these different complementary solutions, we can form a rich ensemble of high performing and diverse solutions. And by doing that, we'll often get much better accuracy if we can do this marginalization effectively. Bayesian neural nets were also a gold standard for a wide variety of problems in the second wave of neural nets, led in many ways by Radford Neal's Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approaches, which don't scale to modern architectures, but we know that in a sense there's treasure buried in some direction and we just need to build the right tools as a community to extract that treasure. And as we started to see, neural nets are also much less mysterious when viewed through the lens of probability theory. Overparameterization, double descent, model construction, and many other properties like being able to fit random labels become very understandable when we think about things from a probabilistic perspective. Why not? These models can be computationally intractable and can involve a lot of moving parts, design decisions, approximate inference procedures, and so on, but they don't have to. And in the last year, there's been really extraordinary empirical progress for Bayesian deep learning, where we now have several methods often providing better practical results than classical training without significant overhead on quite a wide variety of problems. This tutorial will have four parts. This first part is about foundations of Bayesian machine learning, particularly with respect to how Bayesian methods could impact deep learning in particular. 
In part two, we'll be considering a function space perspective of machine learning. In part three, we'll consider several practical methods for modern Bayesian deep learning. The goal of this part isn't just to enumerate all of the state of the art methods, but rather to exemplify many of the foundational concepts that we introduce in other parts of the tutorial with several modern approaches. And in part four, we'll be considering Bayesian model construction and generalization, including deep ensembles and their connection with Bayesian marginalization and how we can build on those connections for the multi-swag approach, which marginalizes within multiple basins of attraction, tempering prior specification, rethinking generalization, double descent with depth trade-offs and uh, a variety of other topics. Now, I'll add a brief disclaimer, uh, which is similar to a nice disclaimer I saw in a NeurIPS tutorial on deep learning with Bayesian principles. This tutorial is not meant to be a review of all things Bayesian deep learning. That may have actually been possible three years ago, but I'm excited to say it's not anymore. We're having workshops now on Bayesian deep learning with hundreds of paper submissions. Rather, this tutorial is meant to provide a complementary perspective, which is largely based in my own experiences and expertise. A decent portion will be based on my own work. In a sense, it's what I would tell myself if I could build a time machine and go back in time. That said, if you feel I should have included something, please send me an email and I'll try to include it next time. So let's go back to this airline passenger number example and really forget everything that we know about statistics and machine learning and you know, think about the foundations and use this example also to set up a lot of notation that we'll use throughout the tutorial. So we have these n training points or targets, observations, y, and they're indexed by x's, x1 up to xn. Generally, the x's could be like time, spatial locations, images. And we want to make a prediction at some arbitrary test input, x star, in this case, could be like the airline passenger numbers in 1961. Now just pause the video for a moment and think about a step-by-step -step procedure that you might might have followed just knowing what you knew in high school in order to solve this problem. If it were me in high school, I would start by thinking about the functional forms that I'm familiar with, like sines, cosines, exponentials, polynomials, and then I would create a functional form that I thought would be a reasonable description of, of what I'm seeing and it might have some free parameters and I would specify an error function, which could be like the square distance between the outputs of, of my function and, and the training observations. And I would minimize that error function with respect to my parameters to learn those parameters. But this approach would involve a lot of ad hoc design decisions, like why squared error and not absolute error, for instance. We can instead follow a probabilistic approach where we suppose that our observations are drawn from a noise-free function, f of x, w, plus, for example, additive Gaussian noise with noise variance sigma squared. And we can then use this observation model to form a likelihood. And then we can maximize that likelihood with respect to our parameters and learn those parameters and then use our conditional predictive distribution given those parameters to make our predictions. We can see by taking logs of the likelihood that if we follow this approach, we'll get exactly the same point predictions as we had using the approach on the previous slide where we just specified the squared error function. However, in this approach, the design decisions are a bit more interpretable. We probably have some intuitions, for example, about whether we want to use Gaussian noise. Perhaps if we thought there were outliers in our problem, we might use a heavy tailed noise model like a Laplace distribution, and that would lead to an absolute value error function. So we can make different design decisions here and derive different loss functions. If we believe our model, f of x, w, to some extent, we can also get an estimate of the noise variance in the data. Now, remembering what we know about statistics, you may be familiar with the idea that either of those approaches could lead to what's called overfitting, where we get very low training loss, but we get very bad testing error. In order to combat overfitting, it's quite popular to introduce what's called a regularizer, where we add some kind of complexity penalty, like we want to penalize the, the magnitude of the weights in our model. But this also involves all sorts of heuristic design decisions, like how do we know whether we want large weights or small weights? It would totally depend on the parameterization of our model. 
what is complexity? How much should we penalize it? We could use some kind of Lambda parameter, maybe determined through cross-validation, but what would be our validation sets? And if we had several Lambda parameters, then we'd have a cursive dimensionality in estimating those parameters. We can gain some interpretability by thinking about maximizing a log posterior, which would equal a log likelihood plus a log prior, and the log prior could be interpreted as a regularizer. But this really isn't a, a Bayesian approach. There isn't much you need to know in order to use a Bayesian approach for your own research. We have Bayes' rule here, which is often expressed as a posterior being proportional to a likelihood times a prior. The normalization constant is the marginal likelihood, what we were considering on the vertical axis of that plot. We had all possible data sets on the horizontal axis. The sum rule says the marginal distribution of P of X is equal to the sum over the joint distribution of P of X and Y, summing out Y. The product rule says that the joint distribution over X and Y is equal to the conditional distribution of P of X given Y times P of Y, or the conditional distribution of Y given X times P of X, and we can derive the Bayes rule from the product rule. Now, ultimately, we want to compute the unconditional predictive distribution, P of Y, given our data, bold Y, but not given parameters. And so the sum and product rules give us this integral in equation 11. The integral of p of y given the parameters times the posterior over those parameters given the data y. And so this is called marginalization because we see w doesn't appear on the left side, it does on the right. In words, this integral is saying, let's not just use one setting of parameters, let's use all possible settings of parameters weighted by their posterior probabilities. And this isn't a controversial expression, it's a direct consequence of the sum and product rules of probability. This model average represents what's called epistemic uncertainty over which function fits the data. There are many different functions corresponding to different settings of the parameters, and we're not sure given a finite sample which is the right description of the data. By representing epistemic uncertainty, we can, we can have some robustness against, against overfitting. We can also view classical training as a special case of this approach where we have an approximate posterior Q of W given our data Y equal to just a point mass, a delta function centered on the map, the regularized maximum likelihood solution of parameters. We can see that if we substitute this in, we're just gonna get our conditional predictive distribution given those maximum likelihood or map parameters. We can also see then that Bayesian and classical approaches will be similar when the posterior is highly concentrated around a setting of parameters, which of course is exactly not the case in deep learning where we have neural nets that are very diffuse in their posteriors. And also the posteriors capture a variety of different models corresponding to complementary explanations of the data. So we're going to especially want to do this integral in deep learning. We can also see that we can probably do a lot better than classical training in terms of estimating this integral by using some fairly simple posteriors, which might not be good descriptions of the exact posterior, but are still a lot better than, than a point mass. So we can definitely improve our estimates without needing to have you know, an exact approximation of this integral or an exact representation of this integral. Now there, are fundamental differences between Bayesian model averaging and some types of model combination. In particular, the Bayesian model average is meant to represent a statistical inability to distinguish between hypotheses given limited information, but the assumption is that one of those hypotheses, one setting of those parameters is the correct setting of parameters. And as we get more and more data, our posterior over our hypotheses or parameters, will collapse onto a particular setting and will cover the maximum likelihood solution. So this is different than some approaches to ensembling and model combination, which work by enriching the hypothesis space and assuming, for example, that combination models might be a correct description of reality. Now let's exemplify some of these ideas with a few applications. Suppose we flip a biased coin with a probability lambda of landing tails. I'd like you to pause the video and answer these three questions. One, what is the likelihood of a set of data y1 up to yn? So we're just doing n flips, maybe we see m tails. Two, 
What is the maximum likelihood solution for lambda? Three, suppose the first flip is tails, what is the probability that the next flip will be tails using our maximum likelihood estimate for lambda? You can assume m tails and m flips. So the likelihood of our data is just a product of Bernoulli distributions, two possible outcomes. Here we have y equals one if yi is tails and y equals zero if yi is heads. If we don't care about ordering and we observe m tails, then our likelihood is a binomial distribution. m tails here. Probability of getting tails is lambda. And we can easily maximize this likelihood. You could try taking logs of this expression, then derivatives with respect to lambda, setting those derivatives to equal to zero and so on. And we'll get the solution that the maximum likelihood setting of lambda is m over n, where we have m tails and total flips, which in a sense is kind of intuitive, but on the other hand is kind of problematic. Why do you think this estimate might be problematic? And in considering this question, Think about the third part of the problem. What's the probability that we would get tails on the next flip, assuming we've done one flip and we've just observed tails using this estimator? Pause the video and think about the problem for a moment. So if we substitute in m equals one, n equals one, we're saying there's a 100% chance that the next flip was tails. Do you believe that? Of course not. And when we arrive at a clearly unbelievable prediction, it's usually because some part of our model, modeling procedure has not honestly represented our beliefs. Let's think about a Bayesian approach to this problem. If we choose a prior p of lambda proportional to lambda to the alpha, one minus lambda to the beta, then the posterior, after we multiply the, the likelihood against the prior, will have the same functional form as the priors. This is called a conjugate prior. A beta distribution has this functional form. The gamma functions here are for normalization. We can analytically compute the moments of the beta distribution. Here we have visualizations of the beta distribution corresponding to different settings of its parameters, A and B. We can see in the top right panel if we, if we want to express the belief that we don't know what the bias is, then we can use a uniform distribution, setting a and b equal to 1. And this means lambda is equally probable for any value between 0 and 1 a priori. And so we can express you know, even the idea that we really just don't know using a prior distribution. We don't need to have an informative prior. However, we might want to consider a prior that says, well, we think that the bias is probably close to a half, but we're not going to say it's definitely a half. Just choose whichever prior is an honest reflection of your beliefs, even if your belief is, I don't know. So we can multiply our prior with our likelihood to get our un unnormalized posterior. This is a beta distribution. We can compute its moments and use the posterior expectation over lambda for our predictions. We can see in equation 27, it's m plus a over n plus a plus b. Now let's consider a few questions. It's good to do some sanity checks here. Well, what's the probability the next flip is tails? Let's suppose that a and b are one. We can see that it's not gonna be 100% if m is one and n is one, so that's good. What happens when we make a and b really large? Well, the prior starts to dominate, so that gives us a strong prior. If we make the data really large, then both n and m will be large, and m over n will dominate in this estimate, and we'll recover the maximum likelihood solution, which is what we want. That's a good sanity check. And now I'd like you to consider this fourth question, which is conceptually very important. Does the map estimate what we get when we take the argmax of the log posterior over lambda which is equal to the argmax of the log likelihood plus the log prior, with a uniform prior over lambda, give the same answer as Bayesian marginalization to find the probability that the next flip is tails. Pause the video and think about this question for a minute. So if we have a uniform prior over lambda, then log p of lambda won't affect our optimization in equation 31, and we'll just get the maximum likelihood solution. 
And we just saw that when we do marginalization, we get a different answer than the maximum likelihood solution, even with a uniform prior. So I can't emphasize enough that we should not interpret Bayesian methods as regularizers in optimization. There is a conceptually very important difference between marginalization and regularized maximum likelihood optimization. And that difference will be practically crucial when we're thinking about Bayesian methods in deep learning. Let's consider one more example. Suppose we have observations y1 up to yn drawn from an unknown density p of y. We'll start by specifying an observation model. We'll suppose that the points are drawn from a mixture of Gaussians, and in order to estimate this unknown density, we'll learn the parameters of this mixture of two Gaussians. Parameters here are the weights, the means, and the variances. So we can use the observation model to form a likelihood, and I've just written it down here. And I'd like you to pause again and think about choosing a setting of parameters which will provide a lot of likelihood without you know, having to take derivatives and stuff like that. You can just kind of look at this expression and play with a few settings and find something and just think about the, the means and the variances. Don't worry about the weights. So if we make, for example, the mean of the first component equal to one of the data points, then this x will disappear. It'll just be one and we get this normalization constant w1 over square root 2 pi sigma 1 squared. And then we can make sigma 1, the variance or the standard deviation, very small for the first component. And then this term will blow up. And the other term we can use to assign density to all the points. So we're not multiplying against zeros and the likelihood goes to infinity. Now, do we believe this solution? Of course not. We typically wouldn't believe our data are comprised of point masses. And when we reach an unbelievable solution, it's typically because we haven't fully represented our beliefs in our modeling procedure. We could introduce a regularizer or a prior, which would go to zero faster than the likelihood goes to infinity as the variance parameters go to zero. But we might want to include the point mass solution as long as it's one of an uncountably infinite number of solutions, which we can do through full Bayesian marginalization, in which case we can use extremely flexible models, even infinite mixtures of Gaussians, corresponding to Dirichlet process mixture models, and achieve good generalization, even with a small number of points. Now, ultimately, as we've been saying, we wish to compute a Bayesian model average corresponding to our unconditional predictive distribution, P of Y given data, rather than our conditional predictive distribution, P of Y given parameters W. This unconditional predictive distribution is equal to the integral of our conditional predictive distribution times our posterior P of W given data. This is just an expression of the sum and product rules of probability. Rather than use a single setting of parameters, we want to use all possible settings of parameters weighted by their posterior probabilities, which is going to be especially impactful in deep learning, where we have highly diffuse posteriors containing different settings of parameters that correspond to a variety of compelling and different solutions to a given problem. For most models, including Bayesian neural nets, this integral is not analytic. It's common to use what's called a simple Monte Carlo approximation, where we take an average of the conditional predictive distributions for different settings of parameters sampled from an approximate posterior Q of W given data. We find these samples typically through one of two approaches. Deterministic methods approximate the posterior distribution with some convenient distribution Q. Although the integral can't be computed in closed form, typically we can represent the unnormalized posterior analytically, it's just the likelihood times the prior. Q, our approximate posterior, is chosen for convenience, often so that it's easy to sample from, like a Gaussian distribution, in which case its parameters would be its mean vector and its covariance matrix, which we choose typically to make Q close to P in some sense. For example, variational methods find these parameters by minimizing the KL divergence between Q and P. As we mentioned earlier, classical training is a special case of approximate inference where our approximate posterior is just a point mass centered at the maximum likelihood or regularized maximum likelihood map setting of parameters. The Laplace approximation is another popular deterministic method, which we'll discuss further in part three. Expectation propagation is another popular approach, and there are several others. We could alternatively consider Markov chain Monte Carlo, which forms a Markov chain of approximate but asymptotically exact samples from our posterior. Metropolis-Hastings is a popular MCMC approach. 
Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uses gradient information and was very successfully developed by Radford Neal in the mid-90s for Bayesian neural nets. Recently, stochastic gradient MCMC methods have been very up and coming and exciting approaches in Bayesian deep learning because they algorithmically resemble SGD, which means they can be applied in a wide variety of, variety of applications where you might otherwise use classical training, but often with better results. Stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics and stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or stochastic gradient MCMC approaches we'll discuss in part three. Later in part four, we'll also argue that we may sometimes want to avoid the simple Monte Carlo perspective in equation 33. Really, what we're most interested in ultimately is estimating this unconditional predictive distribution in equation 32 under computational constraints. And from this perspective, it's helpful to think of estimating that integral as an active learning problem under constraints, in which case the deep ensembles method can be very compelling as an approximate Bayesian method, which we'll discuss in part four. That's the end of part one. In part two, we'll be considering a function space perspective. Hi, I'm Andrew. Thanks for coming to the tutorial. And uh, feel welcome to ask any questions you might have at this point. So I have a question from Nikola Karemanov. Can you expand on the difference between regularization and priors? So that's a great question. Often. Um, Bayesian methods are, some are, are talked about as if they're providing some kind of regularization. And I feel like this is a, a kind of a dangerous mischaracterization because if we're doing um, optimization of a posterior, uh, we can see that it will, it will sort of split up into uh, optimization of a likelihood uh, plus a, a prior if we take logs. Um, and you know, from that perspective, the prior can, can be interpreted as a regularizer. But that's really not a Bayesian approach because it's still choosing Sorry, I'm just hearing a bit of audio feedback. Uh, uh, that's not a Bayesian approach because it's still betting everything on a single setting of parameters. And if we had, a say, an uninformative prior or a prior that didn't have a particular preference for any setting of parameters, if we're doing regularized optimization or maximum a posteriori estimation, it's not going to affect our solution because um, that prior won't actually depend on the setting of parameters that we're considering, and we'll get exactly the same as just the, the maximum likelihood solution. But if we do Bayesian marginalization, where we're actually doing a model average corresponding to our predictive distributions with different settings of the parameters weighted by their posterior probabilities, a uniform prior will give us a very different answer. And we saw one example of this with the, the coin toss problem. If we said, well, we have no idea what bias the coin might have, we'll just put a uniform prior that could be any bias. We, we will make a very different prediction than what we would do in a maximum likelihood setting or say regularized maximum likelihood setting in that case where we would say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna bet, you know, if we've just seen one tails that every other flip will be, be tails, which is clearly, you know, not representative of our beliefs. And so this will be, this kind of conceptual difference will be extremely important in, in deep learning in particular, because even if we have a very broad prior over our parameters, a priori, we're going to get a very different answer from marginalization um, because um, we're going to be considering all sorts of different parameter settings in our posterior when we're coming up with our final predictive distribution. And neural nets are capable of representing quite often um, many different complementary explanations to a given problem. And we'll see that the loss surface is, is really multimodal and there are lots of different global optima. And from that perspective, it's actually quite arbitrary just to say, let's bet everything on one of these solutions and do optimization. And um, probability theory just gives us a principled way of combining these, these solutions together using the sum and product rules. Um, so uh, in that sense, the, the sort of Bayesian model average is just a direct consequence of the sum and product rules of probability. And um, uh, 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 I, think, I think, yeah, it, it can be quite sort of misleading to think of, of Bayesian methods as providing regularization in this sense, because they are quite meaningfully, giving you something quite meaningfully different than regularized optimization. Did that answer the question? Uh, Anchor also asked a similar question. Okay, feel free to uh, uh, follow up on that question uh, later if you're, if you're still wondering, because it is a very important distinction that I would like uh, you know, everyone to, to understand. Um, so uh, another question, Tianyu. Uh, I'm wondering what the advantage and disadvantage of Bayesian deep learning over Gaussian processes in terms of capturing the predictive uncertainty. 
That's a great question. Um, so I don't think that um, Bayesian deep learning and, um, and, and Gaussian processes are really orthogonal. They're fairly complementary. And in part two of the tutorial coming up next, we'll actually uh, sort of take somewhat of a Gaussian process perspective to Bayesian deep learning. Uh, so uh, definitely feel free to, to ask any, any questions uh, about that connection uh, after that part where it may, may become clearer. Could you discuss what happens if a model is not identifiable, even in the limit of data? In system identification problems, will Bayesian methods work and would some work better than others? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so if it's not, I mean, you could end up with scenarios where uh, there are just multiple settings of parameters, even with lots and lots of data that provide equivalent explanations. This would be fairly unusual. But in that case, we would still do a Bayesian model average. It's what the sum and product rules tell us to do. And um, uh, 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 often we'll, we'll, we'll you know, see better performance by, 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 by doing that Bayesian model average. With a neural network, um, we would get you know, many settings of parameters which provide equivalent solutions to the data. So in that sense, um, you, you also wouldn't see collapse just to a point mass. You would get a bunch of different point masses in different locations. But in this case, they would be equivalent solutions. So just using one of them versus averaging them would give you the, the same answer. Um, will you be addressing the problem of choosing a prior in the following sections? So we will discuss prior selection, especially in parts two and four. Um, I would characterize the, the key distinction between a Bayesian and a non-Bayesian approach is really posterior weighted marginalization versus optimization rather than a prior versus no prior. Um, as we saw briefly in this first part, um, regularized optimization also uses priors. There are other methods like what are called Bayes classifiers, which use priors to sort of flip a generative approach into a discriminative classification rule, but they're, they're not Bayesian because they're still betting everything on one setting of parameters. Um, as we'll see um, somewhat in, in, in both parts, parts two, three, and four, um, uh, having a fairly generic prior over parameters when combined with a functional form of a model like a neural net, which is quite structured, actually induces a fairly structured prior in function space, which has lots of useful properties. And so we'll go into that, especially in parts two and four. So there's a question... Um, in one of the slides, the model density conditioned on the data was suggested to collapse to a Dirac with infinite data. Why should this be the case? What is assumed about the data here? So the assumption is that the data are generated by the model corresponding to a particular setting of parameters. And the Bayesian model average represents the statistical inability to distinguish between different hypotheses corresponding to different parameter settings given limited information. But as we get more and more data, eventually there'll be more and more support for one of those hypotheses and we'll see a collapse. And if you're interested in reading more about this, I suggest looking up what's called the Bernstein von, von Mies theorem. But the, the basic idea is, as we get more and more data, it'll be very much harder for our model to kind of explain that data with most settings of parameters. And one setting of parameters will sort of emerge as a much rel a relatively much, much better sort of explanation. Uh, maybe we could sort of imagine this in function space, which we'll be talking about a lot in part two is saying, well, as we keep adding data points, we start ruling out all sorts of different functions, which actually could be consistent with those observations. And so those parameter settings associated with those functions become much less likely. Um, could you, let's see. Post Posterior of deep learning methods are highly diffuse, possible intuitions. So we will discuss this um, uh, further uh, in, um, in, in, in the other parts. Uh, but the basic idea is that neural nets are very flexible models, meaning that different settings of the parameters can describe quite a range of different problems quite, quite effectively. And um, if we're just given a limited data set, that means that the posterior is going to say, well, there are many different parameter settings that actually are all pretty similarly good explanations of the data. So um, it's, you know, even though we will see collapse eventually as we get more and more data, in practice, we're not really going to be realizing that collapse, especially when we're using these neural nets that have, say, tens of millions of parameters on problems with 
say, tens of thousands of, of data points. And so this is actually when Bayesian model averaging is going to make the biggest difference. Um, if, on the other hand, the posterior was very collapsed, such that where the posterior had mass, there wasn't a lot of functional variability, then we might actually not see too much of a practical difference between a classical and Bayesian approach. So because the model is sort of underspecified by the data in deep learning, meaning that um, there are going to be lots of different settings of parameters in the posterior which give rise to similarly good models, um, there's kind of particular promise and you know, excitement about deploying, deploying Bayesian methods in this space. And it'll make a difference not just for point predictions, but also for um, also, I'm oh, sorry, not just for uncertainty, but also for the accuracy of, of point predictions, which is sometimes an, an overlooked benefit of, of a Bayesian approach in this space. How is averaging equivalent solutions that represent different parameter settings the same as picking one of the solutions? So the idea in this comment was that um, if, in the end, the model average is happening in, in sort of function space. So we look at the different functions that we get corresponding to different settings of parameters. So we have our neural network, it has parameters w. And when we give those parameters particular values, we get a function that fits our data. And so uh, we, when we're doing our Bayesian model average, we're averaging a bunch of different functions corresponding to different settings of those parameters weighted by their posterior probabilities. If um, a bunch of different parameter settings are giving rise to the same functions, then we're just taking the average of the same function a bunch of times, which will give us the same answer as just using that function once. Um, so that was that intuition. Although, um, you know, this is not something that's, that's really sort of much of an issue because for any, you know, given practical, well, it, would, it would never really be an issue, but, but um, in, in, in practice, um, uh, uh, we're, we're typically averaging over uh, functions which are often quite quite different from one another. So um, we're actually seeing quite a big benefit in, in doing that, that Bayesian model averaging procedure. How would you be able to interpret the model parameters when you use multiple settings? Um, that's a good question. Um, and so uh, the, the question again was, how, how would we be able to interpret the model parameters when we use multiple models, multiple averaging? Um, so there, there, this is not an easy thing to do in general. Uh, uh, it's sort of trying to relate parameter space to function space. And we will discuss this, you know, especially in the, you know, parts, parts two, three, and four. Um, but, um, you know, one thing you can do in some, some settings is to actually try to visualize the functions you get corresponding to the different parameters. Um, you can also uh, try to look at, you know, how these different functions co-vary. And these will be things that we actually look at in sort of greater detail in the, the other parts. So feel free to, to ask the question again um, later on if it's, if it's not answered. Do we necessarily want the map as an estimate? So I would argue we do want, uh, don't want to use map <laughs> as an estimate, especially in deep learning. And that's because when we're doing map optimization, which is called maximum, which means maximum a posteriori optimization, um, uh, we, um, we are really not doing something that's Bayesian. We're still betting everything on one setting of the parameters. So that's basically the same thing as just doing, say, L2 regularized classical training. And because in deep learning in particular, the different parameter settings are giving rise to very different types of functions, um, you know, we really want to combine those, those different solutions together. And when we do that, as we'll see later on, we often achieve much better performance than if we were to bet everything on, on one hypothesis with which with hindsight actually seems kind of arbitrary. If, if we, we say, okay, well, the, the model is, is able to provide a lot of different solutions with similar likelihood or similar posterior density, um, you know, why would we just say, okay, well, let's you know, randomly kind of pick one of them. Um, probability theory says, let's, let's combine them all together. And you know, that'll, that'll make a big practical difference in this setting. Um, in practice, thanks for the question. Uh, in practice, when training a DL model, uh, one often does multiple passes through a training set. How does this interact with Bayesian DL in particular? How can we make sure that our optimization method distinguishes K passes through the training set versus having a training set that is K times larger? Um, so I think that would um, sort of depend a lot on the approach that is being used for approximate Bayesian inference in deep learning. Um, you would have to be careful that you're not 
you know, overcounting the data. Otherwise, you could maybe artificially see some kind of posterior collapse. But it would, you know, how you how you handle that would depend a lot on the specific method. We'll be discussing a number of different approaches in in parts two and three in particular. And so, uh, if you're kind of wondering how to deal with that with respect to a particular approach, I'd be happy to to follow up follow up further on that question. But it, it in practice, it it isn't an issue that you, usually you can sort of you know figure out a, a good way to avoid overcounting the data. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, yes. Um, so Tianyu is asking, if I remember correctly, there is some theoretical work that says when the temperature is less than one, um, the tempered posterior of a sparse BNN with spike and slab prior has very good concentration properties. Would this be the case when the posterior is not diffuse? So we actually, so this question is referring to a procedure called uh, tempering or temperature scaling, which is um, what happens when we raise the likelihood to a power one over T. And we'll actually be discussing that in quite a bit of depth in, in part four. Uh, and uh, this can be a, a useful, in short, it can be a useful procedure. It basically reflects the, the belief that the model is somewhat misspecified, which I think is a good thing to do because I believe that at a high level, Bayesian methods are just trying to honestly reflect our full beliefs in the modeling procedure. And often our beliefs include that our model is somewhat misspecified and we should actually try to correct for that in some way. So I would actually generally advocate for tempering, but we'll be, we'll be discussing that in a lot more depth in the, the last part of the tutorial. I copy my question from the Zoom chat. What do you think of black box variational method for approximate estimation of the posterior parameters? That's a great question. It's one we'll, we'll be discussing um, in, in, in detail in, in part three when we consider uh, various different uh, strategies for approximate Bayesian inference in deep learning. And in general, they all have you know, somewhat different pros and cons. The question from Gisela, can you please clarify why a specific classification model is not considered Bayesian? Can we relate Bayesian more to generative models? It's an interesting question. So um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the terminology often <laughs> confuses the, the challenge of trying to distinguish, say, a Bayesian from a non-Bayesian approach. I would say that the kind of one really key distinguishing factor is trying to do this marginalization. So that's meaning do this Bayesian model average, use a posterior weighted average of a bunch of different models rather than bet everything on a single hypothesis. Because if we try to sort of think of something else to define it, like, oh, it uses a prior, then that wouldn't actually really distinguish the Bayesian methods because there are lots of approaches that could be viewed as using a prior of some sort, like regularized optimization, as we mentioned earlier on in the tutorial, um, uh, 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 that's you know, really you know, aren't Bayesian. They're, they're not doing model averaging. Bayes classifier is another example. It's kind of confusing because it's called Bayes, but uh, because it uses, it uses Bayes rule. But um, uh, Again, that typically is just betting, betting everything on one setting of the hypothesis, uh, uh, betting everything on one, one hypothesis. So um, with a Bayes classifier, um, we can start with sort of uh, a, a class conditional density, say x given y, if x is an image and y is a class label, and then use Bayes rule to invert and get uh, a classification rule for y given x. But it's just an instantiation of Bayes' rule. And using Bayes' rule doesn't make a procedure Bayesian. What makes it Bayesian is, is doing this, this posterior weighted model average. Um, so that's kind of a, a high level consideration. There are some details, like some people sort of say, well, you, something isn't Bayesian unless it's fully Bayesian in every respect. So like, uh, you know, if, 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 our, if, if every parameter should have a distribution, then maybe uh, all of the hyperparameters of those distributions should have distributions we can continue on infinitely and so on. And I addressed some of these questions in the, the paper that was linked um, in the, the rocket chat, uh, Bayesian deep learning and a probabilistic perspective of, of generalization. Um, and uh, in some sense, these are sort of open questions, like is temperature scaling Bayesian or not? I would argue that it, that it is, and that the, the real kind of distinguishing property is, is, is doing some kind of substantial marginalization in your procedure.